there's so many rules now. You go to a gig if you're a disabled person and you get told that's where you sit, there's your toilet, and that's your lot, and you can have one friend. So I'll turn up to the exit and the security guard on the, the, the end of the ramp says, oh, no, you can't leave. If we let you leave now, you might get caught in the crowd. So it's basically, I had to wait for 60,000 people to leave. It's also why I gave up playing live because... I love playing live. I used to love it. You know, you go out on a stage and take it over um, and, you know, get the whole audience going. You know, we I used to play quite uplifting pop sort of synth stuff. A bit dark. Some of it was rave. I, I, I have my dalliance with rave, which was where I played the massive capacity, like rave nights. Um, but you just thought, you know, the fight to get on the stage is ridiculous. The main thing that made me feel that maybe music wasn't really right for me anymore was the rejection from record labels. There was just a shed load of prejudice. I mean, I actually had it said to me, no teenage girl is going to want a picture of you in a wheelchair on their wall. Um, so whatever I did, because I kind of kept trying to think I could overcome their prejudice by proving them wrong. So they'd go, oh, you won't be able to record in a studio. So I booked the most inaccessible studio that I could think of, which was worldwide at Mute Records. So I was doing a lot of television at the time, which was paying well. <laughs> I was spending all of it on music and getting nowhere. And then one day I kind of went, hang on a minute, I'm broke. <laughs> and I'm, still... <laughs> I'm world famous because by that time I'd, my TV career had really taken off. But I'm absolutely brassy because I've thrown it all into the band and got nowhere with it. So I thought, oh no, I'll give up and become a TV presenter. At which point my TV career has snow dived, swan dived as well. <laughs> And then I got involved in the car accident where I broke my back again. So kind of, I kind of ended up giving up immensely. So you, you, you had a, a car accident, but before that, um, did you have a, was it a spinal injury kind of before that? I was born with cancer and um, it was a very rare type of cancer. It's still about a hundred people in the world each year get born with it. And oh, wow. back when I had it, it was pretty much a death sentence. So I was put on a drug trial um, from Pfizer, good old Pfizer. <laughs> and they uh, they were looking for people to be tested. But it left me with a paralysed right leg and a few other neuralgic problems. So I went to a mainstream school and I walked with a limp with a caliper on, which, which is like a leg brace made of iron because they didn't even bother making it of steel. So it used to rust. So I used to have to take a toolkit to work, to a school um, and a box of oil. So everyone called me Metal Mickey or Screw Leg because my leg kept falling apart. <laughs> but, um, and then at 15, I had a side effect of the treatment that no one, because obviously no one had had the treatment before. So no one knew mm. that the treatment caused bone defects when combined with radiotherapy. So I was 15 and I was quite a short kid. And then suddenly the Irish jeans kicked in and I rocketed up over a summer holiday from about four foot something to about nearly six foot. So I was kind of like, pew! Um, and uh, a growing spurt like no one had ever seen. And then as I got sort of a little bit healthier, um, I kind of started just going out. All my friends had disappeared. It's something that anyone that becomes disabled will no note that most of your friends just go and they've gone um yeah, that's, and that's something that i found and yeah uh, you, well uh, I, I was quite fortunate and I, I have managed to keep quite a few but i know a lot of other people well, would, imagine as yeah. well what it's like when you're leaving school because all of your mates normally would yeah like you, lots of people you knew would disappear anyway they go to sixth form they go to sort of jobs and you kind of spread out into the world and i disappeared i genuinely just disappeared one day and was gone and uh, kids don't, I wasn't very cool at school. So I had no one. Um, it's just me and my brother who kind of supported me through that period quite, quite a lot. Um, and so I started going out again. And something that struck me while I was recovering was that all of the rules of society were now off. That all the, you know, the, the gloves are off now. I could do what I liked because I'd always realised as a disabled kid in a mainstream school that you got applauded for trying, not applauded for succeeding. I think when you're an adult, it can be a bit troublesome for others. But I think as a kid, it was quite a nice realization to think that I'm the, the, the rules aren't quite the same. My failure is not the same as their failure. So I was doing gigs in, you know, sort of small gigs, little kind of club gigs and stuff. 
and I did a club gig in my hometown of Luton, up Luton, uh, and uh, got spotted by a TV producer. We just have to wait for the people to arrive. Yeah, can you arrive? Yeah, but there seems to be an awful lot of hair falling down. Would you like the mirror, Mick? Oh, yes, please. Thank you. <coughs> A moment of truth. <gasps> oh, oh, what have you done to my hair? Oh, I've got any left. I'm a skinhead. <laughs> no, you're not. There's loads of it there. And that's where it started. Um, so, so what, 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 did, what was the TV kind of yeah, your first break? Well, I was. Like I said, I was playing in, a, in in the Tropicana Beach in Luton, where I used to play in the foyer. But one night, though, I was allowed to play in inside on the dance floor. I had 20 minutes. And this guy <laughs> came up and he went, um, would you like to come and do a screen test for a television? Because I'm a producer and I'm on a stag night. And I came up to Luton thinking, what a dump. And you've actually made it so that my night might actually pay off. So I went and did a screen test at um, ITV, at Thames. And I read the, the script of someone else um, and just did an auto cue read. And they went, yeah, love it. Brilliant. Would you like to work on our show? And I went, yeah. And it was called The Help Roadshow. And it was for ITV. And we went all around the country advising kids and, you know, adults and everything, you know, like family show on how to be more green. Back then, you know, had all these kind of youth spelt y-o-o-f programs youth and they used to kind of the, every now and again they'd go right next week we're going to be talking about what it's like to be disabled and try to go clubbing or have sex or whatever and i'd see it and go oh, hello um have you thought of having a disabled person this is back when phones were like that have you thought of having a disabled person present the item and they'd go no and then i started touring the country doing items for local news. Now for more on those stories, here's Mick Scarlett. Thanks, John. Education Secretary David Blunkett today announced a complete restructuring of the primary school curriculum. Then I got offered uh, a show by Channel 4 called Beat That, and they syndicated it to um, all of the English-speaking countries. So America took it up, Canada took it up, Australia, New Zealand, and I've still got like copies of TV Week from the US with me on the front cover. It's just the weirdest thing. So I became globally famous. Hi, this is Beat That, and that's exactly what this program's all about. Each week, I'll be presenting a team of kids with a problem that they have to beat. They'll be given a time limit and very little help from me. There was a time where most people kind of thought disability means a wheelchair user. Were you able to kind of look at other yeah, um, kind of more invisible illnesses, or, I, or was it I, all just during this time? Gym? I I worked. I began working for the BBC. I started working on a show called One in Four, which was their disability magazine show. Um, back then, almost all minorities had a magazine show. There was a Black Britain. There was a program for the Asian community. There was a gay program. There was a uh, there was all it was there was loads of different, and it was come comes from a thing called the Communities Programs Unit. It was very focused on visible impairments. But then uh, the BBC decided to staff uh, this department with disabled talent. So all the uh, Chris um, uh, Hutchins, the guy that ran this department, was brilliant. And he supported all the people to take over. And he moved over and said, right, you run it. And they started making programmes for disabled people by disabled people, very much like this. But it meant we did tell stories. And uh, it's a programme, I think, that was really, from the edge, that's what the programme was called. It was uh, 35 episodes a year. So it's a lot of programming. It's half an hour programme every week. I couldn't believe it. I don't know if I can say it on TV, but it's better than sex, basically. You, you do definitely get a big buzz out of it. You still worries. Ah, you, you. It could get a bit heavy and it could get a bit boring but it's still got you know millions of viewers each week it was yeah I, I, i've noticed um maybe i've noticed it more recently or maybe it's kind of been slowly building but just in all sorts of different programs then there is just somebody with some kind of 
yeah, it's usually a physical disability that we notice, but um, it, it does seem to be a lot more accepted that you know, various different programs can happen. I think that there are pe that people are being included, but we're not seeing that breakthrough. You know, the BBC has got Nikki Fox. I think that's fantastic. Why have yeah. we only got one disabled person telling disabled stories? You know, everyone thinks that's a step forward. You used to have a whole department. You know, I remember I got broken quite a few times doing television and it took me quite a while to realise that I am totally legally and morally allowed to go, I can't do that. You'll have to move this. It's not legal for you to expect me to just be like everybody else. It does seem a bit silly that, yeah, people are expected to be everywhere in the country within kind of a couple of days. The, the law in the UK says that any body employing a disabled person has to in place, put in place reasonable adjustments to make the job fair. But television doesn't do that very often. And I know that because I met, I worked with a, um, a young woman who uh, had an invisible impairment, but it meant that she couldn't carry heavy objects. And she bowled up with a great big camera bag and was shooting with the camera on her shoulder and it was really hurting her. And she was sort of going, well, I can't tell my anyone that I've got it because then they won't use me. And I'm like, no, you have a legal protection to do that. And it's like, well, if you haven't, if the company hasn't, told their staff that they're entitled to this stuff, then you aren't inclusive. You're just hiring people who are disabled to tick the box. I'm here at City Hall on the South Bank, the centre of London's government and a brand new building. But what I want to know is how accessible is it to someone like me in a wheelchair? Let's go and find out. Well, the first thing I can see is revolving doors. Hmm, great. Can't get through them in a wheelchair. But here's the door, let's see. They're nice and easy to open. Yeah. Hello. Welcome Hello, to Richard, all right. Uh, this is Richard Barnes, one of the Tory members of the GLA. Now, you're going to show me round, aren't you? Well, I want you to show me round. It's very steep, is what I'll tell you, and it's very, very fast. Ah! Cool, this would be great if you're on a skateboard. Forget the London Marathon, it's the London wheelchair, wheel down a big ramp thing. Down at the end here is a right. door which goes okay. back to the, the disabled, disabled parking area. Oh, right. But there's okay. not a sign anywhere. This is really frightening. I would, I'm following the fire exit signs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can tell we're in the bowels of the building, no carpet. More disabled people see places in buildings with no carpet than no any carpet other person. Any. Well, we're lucky I did come by cab, because if I'd have driven myself here, this would have been the opening shot of this open. OK, here are the lifts. And, oh, one has just arrived. Don't you close on me yet? Yeah, that's good. Ah! No. <laughs> you got to be quicker than that. Right. Now it's open again now. Oh. Ah! Get out of this. This should have been right from the word go, and it's not. And now we've got to play catch up again. And once again, the disabled are locked out. Uh, there's always room for improvement, uh, but this building is completely consistent with the mayor's equalities, objectives, and policies. Who would have thought that, you know, after the year 2000, I'd still be on television going, I can't get in, I can't get out, where's the toilet, where's the signs? Surely, just, you know, just common courtesy. It's like being asked to sit at the back of the bus. You've had all the, yeah, you know, all these years of kind of. Uh, getting used to it kind of trying to push the boundaries and you seem very confident it's something i get i've always had it's all right for you you're confident not everyone is as confident as you yeah and the answer is one i'm not as confident as i appear i knew from very early on that when i became paralyzed my life went whew, and the direction i would have gone in had i have had the mild impairment i had would have been like my parents and I didn't want the life my parents had. I didn't want to work in a factory or an office. I didn't want to get married and have kids and just live and die and do what they did. I wanted to be big. I wanted, to, wanted it to matter. And so I kind of, in a way, started to see that thing that we were talking about earlier about, you, you know, you, you're playing by different rules and you can mm. say that's a bad thing or you can actually say, hey, the gloves are off. I can do what I like. Yeah, of course, not everyone's going to be as confident as me. Um, I'm lucky. I, I, you know, I was raised by a mum that made me proud of who I am. I was raised by a mum that made it quite clear that it didn't matter if I needed help. That was fine. I'm also really lucky. I, my confidence really blossomed when I met my wife.
My wife's father had very severe epilepsy. She was raised by a disabled man. She got very badly scalded as a little baby. So she has been in and out of hospital all her life with scar, you know, operations on scars and stuff. Um, when we first started dating, we'd walk down the street and people would scream at her, oh, look at your disgusting arm, because it's all scarred. And I was like, I've never had that. No one's ever pointed at me and gone, oh, disgusting, because I'm disabled. Yeah. And yet she she was, she classes you, she doesn't call herself disabled, but she has all the, the, the same experiences of exclusion and discrimination that I do just because of the way she looks. It's really important that everyone gets that we are a community. The shared thing we have, whatever thing makes us part of this community, whatever impairment, illness, condition, disability, if that's what you call it in your country, whatever you have, what makes you part of our community is we share the experience of not being able to be the person we know we could be because society doesn't let us. And that's it. And it doesn't matter why we face it. The feeling is the same. And again, my wife taught me that. A woman who says, I'm not disabled. I'm a ballerina. Um, I can see, I can hear, I can dance, I can feel everything. But I have a physical difference makes her disabled because I don't think disabled is anything to do with bits of you not working. It's about being excluded. And the way that I mm. see disabilities, I see it applying to everybody. And so that's why one day the Disabled People's Channel will have its own Sky Channel and it will be on all airwaves and it will be disabled all the time and everyone will have fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's met- something I've learned is that they're just, uh, for a lot of people, there's just a point yeah or maybe a period where you suddenly stop and you kind of think what do I want in my life and mm. um I think the you know the, the, the pandemics really yes, highlighted yes, that is that people yeah. suddenly do you know what it's funny the whole country the whole world and... has gone through an experience that we have well I think it's one mm. of the other things that makes us a community it makes it an identity rather than about what bits don't work is most of us have this moment where someone goes you, you kind of go uh that that's life totally screwed what is tomorrow going to be mm. I, I when I was 15 they told me I was dying and I had uh, about 48 hours where I was sure I'd got cancer again and that was it I basically said if it's cancer we won't be able to do anything wow. and I laid in bed yeah. and I just thought what am I going all these things I'm not going to do um I I had that experience and then they went oh no you're not dying and I went oh my god now I know what it's like to die I was in a terminal ward as well at the time I suppose it's just that realization that I can, I can have a voice, or I do have a mm. voice, and I know there's a lot of people who feel they don't. So, yeah, I, I kind of reluctantly am in this result and um, this role of kind of, yeah, presenting some of these, uh, yeah, these videos, these interviews. But it's something that I know that I can do, and um, it's such a pleasure to meet people like you who. Yeah, they're kind of, yeah, I suppose, leading the way and kind of trying to change, try and change things from the front in a big shouty kind of way, as you yeah. mentioned. But it's, it's part of the reason why when I saw it, I wanted to get involved because um, the, the concept is one I've been banging on about ever since I left the BBC when we made a programme for disabled people. It's a channel or mm. a programme that gives people the information they want. You know, we just done an interview with Chris Halpin. We, we talked about disability, we talked about music, we talked about technology, we talked about, that's what people want, but they want to know they can do it. They also want, you know, chats like this that come into detail about experience and your life and, mm. and stuff like that. They want, and we don't get it. What we used to get was, uh, the two things we get in a minute in the media are either, hello, here's a program about someone that's disabled, and we're going to talk to you as if you know nothing about it, because this isn't for disabled people, it's for non-disabled people to tell them about what it's like. Ooh, ooh. Or we get, hello, I'm a disabled person presenting a programme and I'm not going to talk about it a bloody tour because I'm trying to be inclusive. And I don't want to mention the fact that I'm disabled. And now I'm going to go to a farm and I'm just going to wheel across a farm in my wheelchair, as you do like. And now I'm going to be up a mountain. Okay. Why? We don't get the story that we want. This is our truth. Mm. And it can be your truth and my truth can be different. But that's the point of the community idea, the people's channel is it's for all of us to tell our story. And I think that's why I wanted to get involved. That's why I think it's a great idea. And I think that you might think that you're this quiet, like just, uh, but you've probably done more 
to set up change, you and Julian and the whole team have set up more to make change for the next few years than you realize. Because giving people on a global scale, because that's what this can do, a voice yeah. to tell their story is something we've been denied. I mean, we've been denied in England and we have it lucky, you know, mm. that people all over the world that are disabled can tell their story. And so, you know, I think it's a great thing. And I, and I, I, I see massive things for the future. And I think you should all be very yeah. proud of what you've put in place. The little seeds that you have planted, I hope will blossom into something that is globally life-changing. <laughs> Um, yeah, th thank you. That, that is quite, uh, yeah, well, it is encouraging just to kind of hear that uh, people like you recognise that, you know, what we're doing in this seemingly small way, I suppose, but um, yeah, it it can be global. Um, we have spoken to people right across the world um, and seen a lot of different experiences. So um, hopefully just chats like this and also, um, yeah, you mentioned about the chat with Chris Halpin, and in there we talked about some of the, or you talked about some of the the tech that uh, can be used to kind of help produce the music and things like that. And uh, it's really exciting to see where, uh, yeah, things move forward onto. And uh, yeah, I, I look forward to kind of speaking to you hopefully and other people on the disabled people's channel and uh seeing what we can do from here there is no way you're being